Good day, everybody, and welcome to the QSO Today Expo. My name is Mike, VA3MW, and I'm going to be talking to you about remote, HF remote operating. How I got into it, what I love about it, things you need to consider if you're going to get into it. Now, first, I wanted to thank the organizers of the QSO Today Expo for allowing me this time to speak. And I also want to thank you for taking the time to listen. And hopefully, I can give you some thoughts and ideas of things you want to consider should you want to do some operating remotely of your HF station. This can be the type of operating where I just want to use my ham shack while I'm away from the basement and I'm on the deck, to something I may be away from a day or two, to something I may be away for a month or two, full blown up into a complete contest station. So we have some ideas that might work for you and give you some thoughts. So what is HF remote operating? So like I mentioned, it's about the ability to not have to sit in front of that desk probably in your basement like most of us. Heck, my first station started in a crawl space that was four feet high. And take it with you. So I'm going to show you a picture right here. It just happened to be the other day I shared with a customer. Uh, it shows in the middle of my workstation. Okay, I was actually working. And I, on my right, I have my Flex Maestro. And on the left, I have a computer screen that's connected to a computer local to my radio, which is on the same property, but it's still four or 500 feet away. This, is, this can be remote operating for some people. If I have a problem, I can walk over to it and change antennas or reboot something or whatever it takes. So why do we want to remote operate? Well, there's a couple of reasons. For me, it started because of an issue I had in the city of Toronto. I had just moved from one part of the city to another. And the original house I had in was the classic home ham station. I had a 50-foot tower, I had a tri-bander, I had a two-meter beam on top of that, and I was able to squeeze in some room for a 160-meter, I think it was a linear loaded antenna, and I was in all bands from 160 through to UHF. And it worked really well. And the noise floor wasn't so bad. Well then, I moved to a different part of Toronto. And in the first week of being there, you know, with boxes of, in the garage and everything, I still wanted to see what was going on, so I took my FT897, and I took a water bottle and I had some big trees in the backyard and I whipped this long wire up and put on a, um, uh, a tuner and tuned around on 40 about 8 o'clock at night in the fall. Couldn't hear very much. Must be a solar storm. So I checked. No, well, there's no solar storm. Looked at the cluster. It was busy. And what I learned is what everybody else was seeing. My noise floor was really high. So I spent some time working on it and I came to the conclusion that a lot of it was in my own house. So I spent a lot of time looking for that. And then I learned about chokes because of a document I found online by the Yankee Contest Clipper Club. And if you Google Yankee Contest Clipper Club and the word choke, the first hit is a PDF document. And if you want to know the value and the power of chokes, I highly recommend you read that document. So shortly after, I ended up buying some Mix 31 and Mix 43 chokes and donuts and stuff and started choking my antennas. And I'd put a choke at the antenna at the feed point, and I'd put another one down by the radio. This made a difference. It started to knock down the noise floor as I learned a bit about common mode currents. And uh, generally, they're bad. So more digging, and then I found out that a lot of wall cubes, this goes on for years, of course, that wall cubes are bad. And I, the worst ones I found initially were the Garmin ones for my, uh, for my cycling. Uh, computer. It was terrible. It was a great noise generator. So it was gone. I had to replace it with something else. And um, I found a lot of these problems by just walking around with a handheld that happened to have uh, VHF AM on it and the aircraft band and the antenna. And I just hold it up to things. And <laughs> oh, well, that's bad. And you'd find good and bad ones. It gave me a great reference. And um, I think that handheld had the ability to go down into HF as well. So as I got more and more into it, I would go looking for these more noise generators listening at lower frequencies. It worked incredibly well. So that all helped, but it still wasn't great. So I also had access to this cottage. In fact, I'm at it now. You can see some of the trees in the background. And um, I started operating in the summer now from up there with the same long wire and the radio and whatever. And a lot of the stuff that I had was still put away in boxes. Um, Wow, the pans were actually open. I could hear things. So about 2005, I picked up a Kenwood TS-480 because it was the only HF rig available that had all the CAT commands available on the radio. A CAT, RS-232, Serial, they're all the same thing. 
And Ham Radio Deluxe allowed me to control that radio in its client server mode, uh, which some of you may be aware of or may not. But So I left a PC uh, in the boathouse, actually, with the radio, and I could connect to that PC over the internet once I got internet at the cottage, because that was the next big challenge. Uh, the, uh, the cable company, uh, which provided the internet, by the way, wanted $10,000 to run about 900 feet of RG11 coax into the property. Well, I worked at a deal with them and said, I'll buy the coax and I'll pull the cable through a swamp and it'll be my cable, I'll be responsible for it, so I'll never have to call you. And we worked at a deal and they hooked me up. So we finally had internet at the cottage at about 2006. By the way, if you own a cottage, that's a bit, then it was a bit sacrilege because the cottage was about getting away from it all. Wow, things have changed. So that got me on the air. TS-480, Ham Radio Deluxe, I used a Vox because foot switches didn't work remotely yet. And I did a couple of contests, but the TS-480 was, 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 was a handy radio, but it's not a very good radio in a contest. You have AGC pumping and all these things we've solved in the software-defined radio world. So I was, for years, I was putting up with it. And then I moved over to uh, Remote Rig came out, which gave me the control head back home and the radio here. That worked okay, but I sort of had to be at the same place all the time. But at least I had the control head there and a VFO and a knob, and it, it was better. Still had the same radio that wasn't real good in a contest, but that's fine. I was on the air and I could hear things. About, about 2012 and 2013, I... Uh, was at Dayton and I was at the Flex booth and I'd already been playing with the Flex 3000 and the 5000 and I owned a 1500 as well. And uh, I saw the writing on the wall that this technology, the smart SDR technology was the way to go because we were able to get rid of all these semiconductors and stuff and make them into something we could easily change called, uh, you know, in the field programmable gate array. Of course, I know a lot more about that today. But when the 6000 series came out and the 6300 came out, I noticed on the back there was a LAN connector, you know, to hook up the internet to, or, or, or the house LAN. And I, and I cornered Steve Hicks one day and uh, I said, what am I gonna be able to do for that connector? And he goes, pretty much anything. Well, what do you mean by that? He goes, well, you'll find out. And he had this, you know, sheepish grin on his face and he was right. Uh, we came out with uh, Smart SDR and, and the minute that the, the software in Smart SDR allowed you to control the radio in a LAN in your house. I knew where we were going with this long before I started working with Flex. So that became the core of my station. And ultimately, even today, remote operating is a core part of the Flex radio series that is built in from the ground up around this, not an add-on. And that's why, I very, that's why I moved away. You know, I sold all my ICOM equipment, my Kenwood equipment, and all my Yesu equipment. Um, and it's just down to a few of these radios now. But because I found them very limiting in my station integration. So why do we want to do remoting? A, quieter noise floor, I can hear more. B, I was a road warrior for a software company uh, in the past. I was on the road a lot. And there's only so many movies you can watch in a hotel room. So this got me on the, where, on the air, you know, on a Tuesday night while I was stuck in a hotel room. Uh, awesome. Uh, a really popular one is, we can now take things like iPads, iPhones, laptops into long-term care homes and share HF operating with our ham friends that are maybe now in there full time. So they're off the air. And I've seen the joy in their face when you drag up a laptop, hook up to the Wi-Fi or a cell phone or something, and you know they're back on the air in 80 meters and you put the headset on it and they get on the air and, um, you know, and, uh, and start rag chewing with their old cronies. So uh, that's worth a lot. I've also seen a number of hams, actually a fair number, where they're moving from their houses and their big spaces into um, condos or whatever, uh, or even assisted living, where they can't do the HF operating anymore. So they get together and they build a remote station. Now it might be a pretty simple remote station, but it's got a radio and a couple of antennas and you can get on the air. And it's pretty much plug and play to do that. Uh, there's some there's some other tricks you want to add, but for the most part, that gets you on the air. Um, I've seen where one guy says, look, I'll host it all at my house because he's going to be here for a while. And the other six or seven just dial in when they want and share. So there's more and more of that coming. Hey, it also means if you were younger and you build your own remote station, you know, on some swamp land that you bought, which you can usually get pretty cheaply, as long as it's got some version of Internet that you're never going to have to move your ham shack again. 
You know, how many of you had to move and move your ham shack more than once? Oh, the tower's got to come down, the permits, it's a nightmare. So imagine only having to do that once. I think that's pretty cool. And then another idea is clubs. We've also seen a number of clubs uh, install flux radios so that their members can share a club station. And uh, flux radios have this feature called um, Smart Link and Multiflex, both of which now allow you to have multiple users share your radio. And it's not just like they're both looking at the same VFO frequency. They're actually looking at this. They have a whole chunk of the spectrum. They can see from 160 to 6 meters at the same time. So I dial into my radio. I want to be on 20. My buddy dials into my radio. He wants to be on 40. No problem. Um, you may have to do some uh, work with the antenna sharing. It's not, it's not real hard, but it's, uh, the core part of that's already there. Uh, we've got guys who are on 6 and 80 at the same time. Uh, some of them running digital work. And the only caveat doing it this way is that you have to share the transmitter. Well, granted, a lot of us do a lot more listening uh, than talking. That's not so bad either. And the, the, the transmitter sharing is, uh, is built in. So unlike a lot of other HF radios today that have a main receiver and a sub-receiver and a transmitter tied to the main receiver, the Flex Design's got a whole bunch of receivers and a transmitter that you share is required and they're all treated equal. So what types of remote operating are there? We've got the casual remote operating. We've got the full-blown remote, I don't see my station for months. And then we get into the granddaddy of them all because maybe I'm gonna use my remote station for contesting. I've got six or seven antennas, a couple of you know, amplifier or two amplifiers, et cetera. So the casual operator is like most of people. They have a radio in their shack and they either wanna use it from some other part of the house or occasionally while they're away. That's built in, you set up the radio when you leave, pick the right antenna, maybe point the beam in the right direction, uh, and then uh, go to the mall, or go wherever, and uh, get on the air. When you get home at night, if you have any problems, so your modem needs resetting or something doesn't work, doesn't work correctly, you can quickly address that. So the basic remote station, now the next step is, I have some remote property, or like a repeater uh, site, where you're gonna set it, and you're not gonna be there for a week, day, month, or months. You can put down a radio today, add a couple of antennas, and maybe some web switches, which are available from many companies, and turn things on and off as you need. The DC power, the AC power, soft shut down the radio. And then you build on that. You don't have to do this all at once, but now you add a second or third or fourth antenna. Well, now I need a remote antenna switch. Well, there's many solutions out there now for remote antenna switches. Uh, some roll your own, there's some off the shelf ones that work from uh, multiple different companies. And then the next step is how do I turn my beam? Well, the good news is most rotors today are rotator controllers can either be controlled by a web connection, an RS-232 connection, uh, or an add-on kit that can install in your rotor control box, whether it's Yesu or uh, High Gain or MFJ or whatever type of thing. And I've used them all. They're, um, they work really well. Uh, and, uh, and so that, that allows to turn the beam. Uh, stepper controllers can be done remotely. All this stuff now, if you can get it to talk to a PC in any way, sh way shape, or form, you're good to go. What are some of the problems I've had? It, well, first off, if you take your ham shack and you sit down and look at that wall of buttons and stuff is, how can I reset or push any given button on any one of those items? And you may have to replace some things. It's not now the time to cheap out on it. You know, you've invested a lot in your hobby. Maybe your intent is certainly your radio. And, and, and invest wisely in moving forward. Get good quality stuff. Uh, don't always go to the cheapest route because it's not always the most reliable. One of my first nightmares was um, not being able to communicate to the ham shack remotely the first winter I wanted to go through. And I don't generally see my remote ham shack from about mid-October till mid-April. So somewhere about January, and this is the first example, everything, everything was great. It was just the radio and an HF6V vertical. Very simple. I go offline. So I wait a day, I'm still offline. I phone up the cable company. Wonderful people at a company called Cable Cable here in north, um, north of Toronto. I said, hey, um, my modem offline? I go, well, yes, Mr. Walker, your modem is offline. Hmm, any idea what it might be? Yeah, we know exactly what it is. I went, ah, oh, great, what is it? 
Yeah, we put some new firmware. We, we were able to push firmware out to the modem, so we've done that for you. Can you just unplug the power from your modem and plug it back in? And went, not really. I'm 100 miles away. And then I get the, well, why do you really care? And so I have to say, well, I have security cameras and stuff up there. And anyway, so get in the car, drive an hour and a half. On my way there, I stop at a hardware store, Canadian Tire for you Canadians, pick up a timer we use for Christmas trees. Now, this is about 2006. And set the timer so at 3 o'clock in the morning, the power shuts down to the, to the access point or the modem and the router, and it reboots every day. And that worked fine, and that stayed in place for about seven years. Um, today I have done it differently, but you can also buy boxes on Amazon that are designed to do exactly this, along with web switches that allow you to turn power and thing on and off. So moving on, now as you grow your station and you add that beam, that rotor, that stepper, the opti beam, um, auto, you know, tuners, amplifiers, you keep adding more switches. This is how this grows, and you can't do it all on a weekend. So you, you want the tools available to be able to control all those things. Unfortunately, with things like Amazon web switches, or uh, meaning there's a bunch of them, or some of us hams are working on a project called Node-RED, which, which, is, which is an IBM tool that is designed for machine-to-machine -machine communication, meaning I want my radio to talk to this black box. Wonderful product. I'm not a programmer. I call it software wiring because you draw and connect circuits together. And uh, if you're even interested in what we're doing there, please join us on a group on groups.io. And if you just search for Node Red and Amateur Radio, it'll pop right up. Small group. We're there to help from the beginning. You know, how to get started. Uh, all this stuff runs in a Raspberry Pi. It's a great project. You know, we, we love to uh, learn things as ham operators. So uh, don't let it scare you. We'll work through it on you. It's great. So now that I've talked to you about all the different types of remote operating, and there's more, and by the way, leverage your, your guys that are repeater operators, because they've been through this before. They've got all sorts of cool tricks. Um, the reward is now, I can operate from anywhere. I keep a PC local to my radio. Now this is the way I do it. I recommend to my customers this is the way to do it, because I now run all my digital software, my logging software on that PC local to my radio. and then. What I do is use a tool like Remote Desktop, which is built into Windows. You can use any desk, you can use TeamViewer, you can use Chrome has a remote desktop sharing to connect to that radio to access those programs. This means you only have to set up one computer with your logging programs and stuff, all the data is in one place. Uh, you can do firmware updates to things without having to worry about being remote. And this actually ended up working out so well for me when I was on the road that I could take my work laptop, which was all locked down from doing anything, I could do a remote connection to my remote PC, and I was on the air. And I was either doing digital modes or whatever I wanted to do. The same thing for uh, if you wanted to let somebody use their sta your station. Can you imagine? Okay, well, install this program on your PC. Open that port. Do this, do that, that, that. And, you know, they're going to go forget it. It's too much work. Now you just tell them to start up uh, TeamViewer or any desk or some desktop sharing, which we certainly all know more about now, and connect to the remote PC, and everything's configured. They want to do some six meter FT8, boom, they just bring it up, away you go. So that's what I love about the remote operating part, is it's allowed me to be flexible. I can take my PC or my Mac, and I often travel with my Mac to different places, so it's just easy to open up and remotely connect to the PC. I also highly recommend invest in Windows 10 Pro, Amazingly stable. Uh, you can control the updates, which we've all heard rumors about. And in, this is what, 2020? Since 2005, I've had problems with my remote. It has never been the PC. Touch wood. But it's been probably the most reliable piece of equipment. I don't run any antivirus because I don't do anything on the internet with it. The computer is behind a firewall. I um, control the updates to when I can and uh, only install amateur radio stuff on it. And it's been flawless, pretty happy. So one other thing I've learned in these years with streaming data called amateur radio is Wi-Fi is evil. And I know you're all gonna say, but my Netflix works great, or my Prime video works great, or whatever streaming service you work. Well, that's great for watching a movie online because we don't care if that movie's buffered or it's maybe delayed by 30 seconds from when the other person sent it, you know, from their servers who cares how far away? 
But an HF radio operation, which is a real-time operation, we do care. We want to get that within 100 to 200 milliseconds. And Wi-Fi will break that easily. And without spending an hour going through it, the simple description of Wi-Fi is that it's really single-threaded. And while you might be five feet away from your router or your access point, if that access point can hear other access points, it has to give time for those access points to move their data. It has to be a good neighbor. And this is part of the Wi-Fi standard. Where you can, get off Wi-Fi. Have your computers all hardwired. Move your streaming devices to, to LAN cables. I know, you're gonna say, I can't do that because, well, I've uh, moved some of mine using power line devices, which puts your internet on your AC power line. Uh, there are some concerns that might cause HF noise. I've yet to hear one, but I guess if you were close enough, you could. These are things you have to try out. But yes, Wi-Fi is evil, and uh, you will get drops, latency, uh, the Wi-Fi just goes away. These are things you don't notice just mo streaming a movie or generally surfing. But again, this reward, and what I love about it is my station is amazing. I can hear more stuff on six meters than I thought was ever going on. And I operate six meters from home and remote. And my home station's reasonably quiet. It doesn't hear what the remote station hears. And the quieter you are, the more you can hear, which is a and, and you've got to do what you can to knock down your noise. And remote's one way to do it. And you get to enjoy a few things by sharing it with a couple of people, and they get to enjoy it. And being a technical hobby where we get to tinker with stuff and make things work and things fail, so we learn. I've learned a lot. I've had a lot of failures. But I think you'll find the journey is worth the reward. So we're going to have some questions and answers after the end of this. This is a recorded event at the moment, but I am here to answer your questions. So thanks for your time. Thanks for QSO today for putting this on and allowing me the opportunity to speak about my love for remote operating. My name is Mike, VA3 Mike Whiskey, 73.